Eric Jaffe. I'm the chairman of the Free Speech and Election Law Practice Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to our, our breakout session on free speech, originalism, and the First Amendment. We have a great panel. I'm not going to introduce them. I'm going to leave that to Judge Bea to do that, but I'd like to introduce him in case uh, you don't know who he is. Uh, he's a, a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, appointed by President uh, George W. Bush. And for those of you who haven't gone and read the details in the guidebook, I, I commend them to you. They're fascinating. He's had a fascinating life. He's a fascinating judge. Uh, I will not belabor the point, but I will let him get up and talk to you instead, which is what you're here for after all. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the practice group, please uh, thank you for participating. Gosh, with that introduction, I, I'm fascinated to see what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today uh, with all of you and uh, this distinguished panel as to this subject matter. I suppose at this point, everybody has an obligation to uh, remember Justice, Justice Scalia with an anecdote. Um, this reminds me of uh, a couple of years ago when I was asked to introduce Brian Garner and uh, Justice Scalia at the Association of Business Trial Lawyers in Northern California uh, on the occasion of their book, Reading Law. And so I made the introductions and I made a comment that uh, I'd asked my clerks to see how often the book had been cited in, um, in opinions, published opinions, as compared to a couple of other books. And they came back with the results that reading law had been cited 44 times, and Sutherland on statutory construction had been cited 20 times, and Abner Mikva's book had been cited zero. <laughs> and Justice Scalia said, can I have your notes so I can use them to borrow at Houston? <laughs> and then later that evening over a cigar, he turned to me and he said, I'm waiting I'm waiting for the opportunity to start reading an opinion from the bench that commences. This case is here on a writ of certiorari to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, but there are also other reasons to reverse. <laughs> well, good afternoon and, and welcome to the uh, panel on originalism and the First Amendment. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the First Amendment speech. At this convention dedicated to exploring the work and jurisprudence of Justice Antonin Scalia, we are covering a good deal of territory. In this panel, we will examine whether and how originalism in, is consistent with or influential in some of the Supreme Court's major free speech decisions. Has originalism played a significant role in this area of the law, as it clearly has in the Second Amendment, was there too much water under the bridge, uh, meaning non-originalist thinking in major free speech cases before Justice Scalia took the bench and originalism gained popularity? Do landmark freedom of expression cases square with the original understanding of the First Amendment? Our panelists will be discussing all of this and more. Uh, let me introduce then the panelists very briefly. You have their bios in your material. On my left, uh, Nadine Strassen, who, is, uh, who went to Harvard, Harvard Law School, an editor of the Law Review. Uh, she uh, then has been involved in extensive litigation in the civil rights field. From 1991 to 2008, she was president of the American Civil Liberties Union. And when she stepped down and they had a, an event for her, there were three Supreme Court justices in attendance, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Souter, and Justice Scalia. David Raban also went to Stanford Law School. Um, I went there. <laughs> and he now teaches at the University of Texas Law School in Austin. Uh, for many years, uh, Professor Ravan was the general counsel of the American Association of University Professors and distinguished himself in the advocacy of academic freedom. He's also author of a book with an intriguing title, 
free speech in the forgotten years, 1870 to 1920. To his right is uh, Professor David Forty, who went to Harvard, also uh, in England, he took a degree in Manchester and then at Columbia. He's a professor of law at Cleveland State University's Cleveland Marshall School of Law, and he has an endowed chair there. During the Reagan years, uh, Professor Forty was the chief counsel uh, to the U.S. delegation for the United Nations. He's a senior editor of the Heritage Foundation Guide to the Constitution, which is a clause-by-clause -clause analysis of constitutional law. To his right, Michael McConnell, who went to Michigan State and University of Chicago Law School. From 2002 to 2009, Judge um, McConnell was on the Tenth Circuit. Then he went to Stanford Law School to be director of the Constitutional Law Center. He teaches constitutional law and has argued 15 cases before the Supreme Court. And he's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Each of the panelists will have about 12 to 15 minutes, then we'll ask them to ask questions of each other, and then we'll take questions from the crowd. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Bia. I usually stand, but the podium is so low, if you don't mind, I would like to see my notes. I hope you can see me well enough. I didn't realize that I, I got here late, unfortunately. I just got here because I teach in New York until very late at night. So I didn't realize, I should have, that um, we should give an anecdote about Justice Scalia. So I will use some of my time for that. I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to interact with him many times over many years, uh, starting when we were both co-panelists on some of, some of the older folks in the audience might remember uh, the Fred Friendly PBS roundtable discussions. And um, Justice Scalia and I, I, I like to say we were friends, not despite our disagreements, but because of our disagreements, we were invited to debate each other all over the world, literally. And, um, uh, and of course, we, being independent thinkers, strongly did agree with each other on some issues as well as disagree on other issues, but it was uh, kind of sad to me how often members of the audience, in particular students, would come up and evince such surprise that people who did feel so strongly about the issues, some of which we disagreed on, could still like each other so much and respect each other so much. And that, that's a sad commentary that that is seen as surprising. So one little anecdote, um, one of my students went to hear him give a lecture at a nearby law school, and he was giving his uh, you know, original meaning approach to constitutional uh, interpretation as the only, uh, or the best way, or the least bad way, I guess, in fairness. And she went up to him, and she mouthed the mantra that I have uh, indoctrinated all of my students in, which is that they have to be able to articulate and defend all plausible perspectives on all constitutional law issues. And he took her hand and he said, oh my dear, I feel so sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, as always, I'm really delighted to speak at this convention, to share the podium with such respected colleagues, to address such an important topic as free speech, especially now when it is so embattled in our popular culture, although it's generally quite secure in our courts, including the Supreme Court. Before focusing on the panel's specific topic, I'd like to comment briefly on the serious threats to free speech in our society. Uh, to quote the website of the Federalist Society, as you know, you are described as a group of conservatives and libertarians. Lately, the robust protection of free speech has become the special province of both those camps, conservatives and libertarians. In contrast, too many liberals have been 
resisting what the Supreme Court has hailed as the bedrock principle underlying our free speech jurisprudence, what we lawyers call the content neutrality or the viewpoint neutrality principle, that government may never suppress speech merely because the community or government, even the vast majority, consider the ideas to be offensive, even deeply repugnant. Now, in preparing for this panel, we panelists shared with each other brief previews of what we plan to say, and uh, David Forte's preview indicated that he would explain that the content neutrality principle is essentially consistent with the original understanding of the founding generation. So I look forward to his comments on that point. Um, in some important recent Supreme Court cases, this core content neutrality principle has been most strongly and most consistently supported by the conservative justices with the liberal justices undermining it in various ways. Uh, likewise, as has been widely publicized, progressive elements in our society, including on campus, have increasingly repudiated this core neutrality principle, seeking to suppress any expression that anyone subjectively considers to be unwelcome or offensive or that makes them uncomfortable. Uh, even advocating freedom of speech has been described as conservative, which is not a compliment uh, <laughs> from the quarters where that term is being used. And uh, literally, free speech advocacy has actually been demonized and even investigated uh, as harassing on more than one university campus. It has been investigated as hate speech to be advocating free speech. Um, a colleague of mine once described my views quite accurately as libertarian. So uh, for many of my FedSoc presentations, I've uh, felt that I'm coming into the proverbial lion's den. But for this one, I feel the opposite, that I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, and seriously, I urge all of us to do whatever we can to shore up support for free speech beyond the ranks of conservatives and libertarians. And that was the explicit plea of an excellent report that came out uh, last month by Penn, the writer's organization, which was entitled, And Campus for All, Diversity, Inclusion, and Free Speech on U.S. Universities. Uh, and it basically, if I can quote one part of it, uh, it talked about how FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, a terrific group with which I'm happy to work closely, is the most visible defender of free speech on campus. And some of the most outspoken students uh, and faculty members are, tend to be conservatives and libertarians. Uh, so while this report praised FIRE's efforts, it said, uh, given FIRE's visibility, efforts to defend free expression are increasingly being described as part of a right-leaning agenda. Yet free expression has historically enjoyed support from advocates of a broad range of political viewpoints, and it should continue to do so. All groups supportive of free speech should therefore redouble their efforts to ensure that campus free speech is a cause that animates students from across the political spectrum. So I hope all of us will take that to heart. Uh, so with that call to arms in mind, uh, let me return to the specific topic of originalism and the First Amendment free speech clause. Uh, time permitting, I will touch on four points, and I uh, depend on our distinguished moderator to censor me if I start going over time. Uh, so first, the, the conventional wisdom about this subject I will touch on. Second, how various justices have used originalism in their free speech opinions or not done so. Third, what insights we can gain from the actual free speech practices of the founding generation. And fourth, how the Supreme Court recently has used originalism to protect free speech, contrary to the widespread assumption that originalism tends to restrict rights. So first, let me, let me lay out the conventional wisdom uh, on this topic. I'm a non-historian, so I'm not advocating this perspective. I'm merely presenting it. 
Uh, I was intrigued to see from Michael McConnell's preview of his remarks that he's going to challenge the conventional view and explain that the original meaning was much more robust than most people give it credit for. Uh, but as Michael also recognizes, the prevalent view is that constitutional doctrines of freedom of speech and press neither have nor should have much reliance on original meaning, largely because the original meaning as reflected in Blackstone was too narrow. So I'm going to be the straight man for you, Michael, or maybe the, maybe the straw man. Um, and especially as a, as a free speech a fan, I look forward to uh, the promised critique of the conventional narrow Blackstone view. And that view was that freedom of speech and press protect uh, only against prior restraints, in particular against licensing requirements. In contrast, Blackstone maintained that government has broad latitude to impose after the fact punishment for dangerous or offensive speech that has a pernicious tendency. Of particular concern, Blackstone condoned government power to punish seditious libel, namely criticism of officials, even if truthful. But if we focus not on what laws were in place during the founding era, but rather um, on which laws were actually effectively enforced, there is an originalism case against seditious libel, as I will explain in my third point. Um, from his preview, I believe that David Raban is going to comment more about that. But um, now let me go back to the conventional wisdom about our topic. Another prevalent view is that there were scant materials that illuminate the original understanding of free speech at the time when either the First Amendment or the 14th Amendment was framed. So what is the upshot of these widespread views? That was memorably summed up by a leading First Amendment scholar, Rodney Smala, who said, if Blackstone's view of free speech was the original meaning of the First Amendment, then 90% of modern free speech jurisprudence is historically illegitimate. My second point comes from the field of so-called judicial politics scholarship. Uh, to prepare for this panel, I canvassed what experts in that field have to say about various justices' reliance on originalism in free speech cases, cases or the lack of reliance on originalism. One recent study analyzed every free speech opinion through 2010 of Justices Scalia and Thomas, as well as every single free speech opinion that Justice Brennan wrote. Now, given that Brennan opposed originalism and that Scalia and Thomas espoused it, one striking conclusion was that all three justices actually used free speech ori originalism at remarkably similar rates. Uh, Brennan used it much more than one would expect, and Scalia and Thomas used it much less than one would expect. Specifically, Brennan used originalism in about 20% of his free speech opinions, Scalia in only 17%, and Thomas in 29%. Um, as for Justice Scalia's surprisingly infrequent use of free speech ori originalism, I'd like to quote a forthcoming book about his jurisprudence by David Dorson, who extensively interviewed Justice Scalia for the book. And Dorson said, Justice Scalia told me that he recognized that most of his free speech jurisprudence was not originalist. Uh, the usual assumption is that originalism leads to judicial restraint, prompting judges to reject constitutional challenges. Uh, but this study I've been citing showed that all three justices voted to uphold the free speech claims in most of their originalist opinions. Brandon in 90% of them, Thomas in 70% of them, and Scalia in 53%. Um, the study concluded that all three justices used originalism to support a wide variety of arguments in a wide variety of First Amendment cases, but that few patterns emerged to explain how or why a justice would or would not use it in a particular case. Uh, I just want to mention there was one pattern that did emerge, which I want to mention because it relates to the practice group that is sponsoring this panel. Uh, as introduced by Eric Jaffe, the practice group on free speech and election law, uh, and that is that Justices Scalia and Thomas often used originalism in free speech cases about election-related issues, including campaign finance, anonymous electioneering, 
anonymous referendum petitions, and the right of judges to express their views during judicial elections. Uh, the conclusion was that Brennan used originalism in a wide variety of landmark cases, uh, which according to the authors of this study, which shaped First Amendment law over 34 years and continue to guide First Amendment decisions. I can give examples during questions if anybody wants, but now I will turn to my third point, which draws upon recent scholarship by Akhil Amar and others, which has stressed that the original understanding of free speech that is reflected in the actual free speech practices of the founding generation, uh, namely that they actively engaged in speech that was illegal and could be punished consistent with Blackstone's views, including speech that would have violated, did violate the seditious libel laws that were in effect. I'm gonna quote, um, to my knowledge, the most recent book on this topic, which was published this past spring by St. Martin's Press called Revolutionary Dissent, how the founding generation created the freedom of speech by Stephen D. Solomon, who teaches at NYU. Um, I'm just gonna read a brief passage from the book's conclusion. The founding generation saw freedom of expression in the broadest possible terms, at least in the way they actually practiced it. They expanded the public sphere of political speech, engaging in every possible means of dissent available to them. The ratification process involved what is still the most extensive political debate in the nation's history. Americans debated and protested as if the crime of seditious libel did not exist. They could hardly have understood that the First Amendment would allow prosecutions for the kind of freewheeling debate that they engaged in, even as they ratified the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And now my fourth and final point concerns the court's important free speech ruling in U.S. versus Stevens in 2010. Strikingly, this decision radically reread a crucial passage in the 1942 Chaplinsky decision, which has traditionally been read to invite new categories of speech that is excluded from First Amendment protection. But Stevens reread that passage to do exactly the opposite, namely to essentially close the door on any new categorical exceptions. Um, so Stevens relies on history and tradition to say unless an exception has been recognized consistently going all the way back to 1791 when the First Amendment was ratified, uh, we are not going to recognize it at this point. And I think that's so interesting because usually originalism and history and tradition are associated with limiting protection for rights. Uh, traditionally, even in the context of recognizing a new categorical exception to free speech. For example, uh, one of Justice Brennan's originalism opinions was the 1957 opinion in Roth versus United States, which first anointed the obscenity exception to the First Amendment, exclusion from the First Amendment, relying on originalism. Uh, but Stevens turns that typical use of history and tradition on his head and converts history and tradition into a barrier against uh, detraction from free speech protection. And that point is also reinforced by the judicial politics study that I cited earlier, uh, that free speech originalism was used so often by all three of the justices studied to increase protection for free speech. So uh, that shows that we have to resist uh, overly stereotyping or generalizing about uh, the impact that originalism has for or against uh, expanding free speech. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is my first Federalist Society conference, and I'm delighted to have been invited to participate. Uh, I want to start with a couple of disclaimers. Uh, I don't consider myself to be a scholar of originalism. I've read some of the literature on originalism. I have some views about it, but I do not consider myself an expert. Nor have I studied the extent to which originalism 
has played a role in recent Supreme Court jurisprudence. But based on fairly extensive historical research in both primary and secondary sources, I do consider myself an expert on how a variety of Americans thought about free speech in the decades both before and after the framing and ratification of the Constitution. And I'll devote most of my talk to discussing these original understandings of the meaning of free speech. I'll end with some very brief reflections about the relevance of original understandings to contemporary free speech issues. And as I'll elaborate a bit at the end, I believe that original understandings are very relevant in some current free speech cases, but irrelevant in most, because most people living in the 18th century were not confronted with and therefore did not consider the kinds of free speech issues that arise today. So I'll now turn to my main topic, uh, original understandings of free speech. So I want to be a little historical in my own uh, discussion of the history of free speech. Uh, I first looked into the issue of the original meaning of the First Amendment when the Stanford Law Review asked me to review Leonard Levy's book called Emergence of a Free Press, which was published in 1985. And this book was a substantial revision of Levy's previous book published in 1960 called Legacy of Suppression. As many of you probably know, Legacy of Suppression was the first major book about the meaning, original meaning, of the speech and press clauses of the First Amendment. Before Levy wrote his book, virtually all scholars and jurists reinforcing the popular understanding of the American heritage of freedom followed the interpretation of Professor Zechariah Chafee, Jr., the seminal modern legal scholar of the First Amendment. In an article published in the summer of 1919, between Justice Holmes's subsequently famous opinions in Schenck and Abrams, Chafee asserted that the framers of the First Amendment, and now I'm quoting from Chafee, the framers of the First Amendment, quote, intended to wipe out the common law of sedition and make further prosecutions for criticism of government without any incitement to lawbreaking, forever impossible in the United States of America. Chafee's position, though widely accepted, had never been supported by substantial historical evidence, and Levy undertook to find this evidence in the 1950s. To his reported surprise and dismay, Levy discovered historical sources that violated his own predilections and forced him, as he said reluctantly, to conclude that the framers of the First Amendment had left a quote unquote legacy of suppression, hence the title of his book. You know, he said he was disappointed to find this leg of legacy of suppression. It was great for his career, however, because <laughs> it made him the leading scholar of the history of the First Amendment. So after completing his research, Levy accused Chafee of playing fast and loose with skimpy evidence in an effort to conform the past to the American rhetorical tradition of freedom. He was a combative guy, Leonard Levy. Levy offered his own conclusions in Legacy of Suppression as a sadder but more realistic view of the actual tradition. And perhaps most strikingly, Levy asserted that the framers intended the speech and press clauses of the First Amendment, as you've already heard from Nadine, to incorporate Blackstone's declaration that the common law prohibits only prior restraints on publications, 
leaving subsequent punishment entirely to the discretion of the legislature. Now, an emergence of a free press, published a generation later, Levy tempered some of his major conclusions, and I think altered the conventional understanding. As the change in title indicates, he no longer believed that the meaning of the First Amendment reflected a quote-unquote legacy of suppression. More specifically, he now maintained, changing his mind, that the framers went beyond Blackstone's prohibition against prior restraints and intended the First Amendment to protect some publications from subsequent liability. And I say this became the conventional wisdom. But Levy adhered to his original attack on Chafee, continuing to assert that the First Amendment did not abolish the pre-existing common law of seditious libel. And Levy pointed out that seditious libel is what he called an accordion-like concept whose inherent vagueness prevented any kind of satisfactory or consistent definition. And he plausibly asserted, Levy did, that what seditious libel really means is criticism of government that goes too far. And because Levy remained convinced that Americans did not challenge the constitutionality of seditious libel until the debate over the Sedition Act of 1798, he reaffirmed his fundamental position from legacy of suppression that meaningful conceptions of free speech and a free press had not previously emerged in America, not before 1798, not at the time of the framing of the First Amendment. So based on my own extensive research, as I prepared for my review of Levy's revised book, research that turned my long book review into an even longer article, I realized that Levy may have been right about the history of seditious libel. But I came to the conclusion that Levy's focus on seditious libel prevented him from appreciating the substantial libertarian advances that had already been incorporated in the Constitution and had been elaborated in the 1790s, including through some of the discussion that Nadine referred to. In my opinion, Levy failed to recognize that it was possible, it was possible for the framers of the First Amendment, influenced by Republican political theory, to expand the protection for freedom of expression well beyond the boundaries of the English common law while retaining some conception of seditious libel. It's possible to have libertarian understandings of the First Amendment without explicitly saying seditious libel is inconsistent with it. In my opinion, Levy failed to recognize that the framers of the First Amendment, influenced by this Republican political theory, expanded free speech beyond Blackstone. And I believe that the influence of the English radical Whigs on 18th century Americans, well documented by many American historians, is the key to understanding free speech during this period. English radical Whigs in England challenged conventional notions of parliamentary sovereignty. They viewed the people as the ultimate source of power and the government as the agents of the people. Famous radical Whigs in England throughout the 18th century stressed that freedom of political expression provided the most effective way for the people to guard their sovereignty and their liberty against governmental aggrandizement. For them, the radical Whigs, popular sovereignty meant that the people should be able to criticize their agents in government. 
Blackstone, by contrast, asserted the traditional English view that absolute sovereignty resided in Parliament, whose exercise of authority, however arbitrary, could not be controlled by the people. In rejecting Blackstone's conception of sovereignty, the English radical Whigs also rejected his views about free speech. They were connected, sovereignty and free speech. These views of the English radical Whigs did not prevail in England itself, but they did prevail in the United States. The United States Constitution created a republic based on popular sovereignty, and the framers viewed the First Amendment's protection of freedom of speech and of the press as essential to its operation and survival. Throughout the 1790s, Americans highlighted the connection between popular sovereignty and free speech. Of particular interest, James Madison, who wrote the First Amendment, stressed this connection when he successfully opposed a congressional, a congressional resolution in 1794 that moved to censure the newly created Democratic Republican societies for misrepresenting the conduct of government. Madison stated, and I quote now from Madison, if we advert to the nature of Republican government, we shall find that the censorial power is in the people over the government and not in the government over the people. And Madison reiterated and expanded this point in his report in 1800 for the Virginia House of Delegates, which argued that the Sedition Act of 1798 was unconstitutional. He was repeating his prior views. So I want briefly to conclude by commenting on the relevance of this original understanding to contemporary free speech issues. Right. This original understanding clearly is relevant in cases involving the right of citizens to criticize government, and there are many such cases. I think the best example, far from the only one, is the New York Times versus Sullivan case from 1964. And the issue in that case as framed by the Supreme Court was the extent to which the constitutional protections for speech and press limit a state's power to award damages in a libel action brought by a public official against critics of his official conduct. This issue clearly raises the relationship between free speech and popular sovereignty. Many of you probably remember the facts of that case. It was a libel judgment against black clergymen in Alabama and the New York Times for an advertisement in the Times. The advertisement criticized police activities in Montgomery as part of an appeal for funds for the civil rights movement. And the ad contained some false statements of fact. The reasoning of the majority, Justice Brennan wrote the opinion, was that the central meaning of the First Amendment is the right to criticize public officials. And Justice Brennan, for the majority, cited the opposition of Jefferson and Madison to the Sedition Act of 1798. Madison and Jefferson said that act violated the First Amendment. And Brennan concluded that libel can claim no talismanic immunity from constitutional limitations. He based that judgment on the original understanding. Yet even in this case, where original understanding is so relevant, I don't think that it helps determine the appropriate constitutional standard for when, if ever, public officials can recover in libel. The majority held that a public official can recover damages for a defamatory falsehood related to his official conduct only if he proves that the statement was made with quote unquote actual malice. Three concurring justices would have gone further and would have precluded any recovery at all. They would have declared an absolute unconditional constitutional right to criticize public officials with immunity. In later cases, Justice White argued that the actual malice standard was unfair to public officials who were defamed. 
Justice White would have allowed recovery for defamatory falsehood, but he would have precluded punitive damages to protect First Amendment values. In my opinion, the original meaning of the First Amendment supports limiting libel law regarding statements about public officials, but it does not help decide which of these three approaches is best. It seems to me that in the campaign finance cases, Buckley and Citizens United, both sides relied on the original standing, the relationship between free speech and popular sovereignty. And in doing so, both sides argued plausibly from original intent. Uh, or the original meaning didn't resolve the issue, in my view. Even in a case where the issue involved the, the relationship between free speech and popular sovereignty once again. And I think that many current First Amendment cases, probably most, for example, cases about commercial speech, about pornography, about violent video games, about conditions attached to government benefits, these are cases that are not about the rights of citizens to criticize government. The original understanding doesn't help here. So my one sentence conclusion is that the original understanding of the First Amendment can help address some contemporary issues, but that in many cases, we must use alternative modes of analysis. Thanks very much. The uh, section is entitled Originalism and the First Amendment and Election Law. My one contribution to the election law part of that couplet is the following. Yesterday I received in the mail my absentee ballot from the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections. <laughs> Any questions? Now I go to the other part of the couplet. In 1774, the first Continental Congress under the pen of John Dickinson wrote a letter to the inhabitants of Quebec asking them to join the protests against the ministry in London. And in that letter, Dickinson attempts to convince the Quebecois French in Canada, that the English system of rights protection is superior to that which they have been enjoying. And so he lists the most important rights that he thinks would be attractive to the Canadians. Representative government, trial by jury, habeas corpus, non-feudal encumbered land holdings. The last right, I'm quoting, we shall mention regards the freedom of the press. The importance of this consists, besides the advancement of truth, science, morality, and arts in general, is in its diffusion of liberal sentiments on the administration of government, its ready communication of thoughts between subjects, and its consequential promotion of union among them, whereby oppressive officers are shamed or intimidated into more honorable and just modes of conducting affairs. Let's look at the elements that Dickinson outlines here. First, advancement of truth, science, morality, and arts in general. These are truth-seeking, teleological, natural law goods. Second, impelling the government to work for the common good, that is, the advance, the diffusion of liberal sentiments on the part of government. Third, a promotion of union with communication between persons. And fourth, shaming oppressive officers is a check on corruption. 
Now, how much can we use this document as a window to the original understanding of what freedom of speech and press must have meant to the founding generation? Well, first of all, it's a text. And it's a better text than we have in the First Amendment or in the debates regarding the First Amendment. It's more explanatory. Secondly, it was the product of the First Continental Congress, whose resolutions provided for a coherent and comprehensive statement of norms, values, institutional arrangements, and offenses of the uh, against the colonial cause, and became the grounding of much of what would become part of the Declaration of Independence. It was a continental document. It was an emission from the entire set of colonies and the elites of those colonies. It wasn't a regional document. And it was written by John Dickinson. Dickinson was the author of more public documents during the founding period than any of his peers. He authored the Resolves of the Stamp Act Congress. He authored those resolutions of the First Continental Congress that found its way into the Declaration of Independence. He authored Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania, which destroyed the Townsend Act's justification for taxing through tariffs. He authored with Thomas Jefferson the causes for taking up arms. He authored the Olive Branch Petition, and although he did not sign the Declaration of Independence, he was the first founder after Washington, that is, those who were in the Continental Congress, to take up arms in defense of the new nation. He dra drafted the Articles of Confederation, was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, and authored a number of essays in defense of the Constitution. This man had heft. Now, beyond the fact that Dickinson was a recognized authority among the founding generation, beyond the fact that this was an omission of the entire colonial cause, was his defense of freedom of the press in the letter to the inhabitants of Quebec in tune with the norms and practices of the era? Well, let's look at them. Now, one of those elements, recall, was to shame leaders into more honorable and just modes of conduct. Well, that was the warp and woof of the political discourse from the early part of the 18th century against royal governors, through the contests with England after the French and Indian War, through the debates on the Constitution, and the rise of political parties in the 1790s. You could have nothing more consistent with the era's um, uh, values than that. What about the one that we says diffusion of liberal sentiments? That was a sign of the inculcation of civic virtue in leadership, a concern of nearly every single one of the founding generation. And then he says, it's ready communication of thoughts. He's talking about the, the medium, pamphlets, speeches, letters. These letters, the public letter was the medium of the day and was read from from New Hampshire down to Georgia uh, it, by a highly literate, one of the highest literate society in the world, the American colonies were. 80% literacy, women and men. And its consequential promotion of union among the subjects. Dickinson had seen from the writings, such as his own letter from the Pennsylvania farmer, or James Otis's, or John Adams, how such a disparate society, do you know how different we were? The farmer in, in New Hampshire from the plantation owner in Georgia, the difference in religions from Mennonites and Baptists and Presbyterians, how such a disparate society as was British North America in that time had united around certain fundamental constitutional principles. Lastly, the advancement of truth, science, morality, and arts in general. Can you not think of, of, of Adams or Jefferson or Dickinson or Franklin's satires um, without thinking that they all regarded this late Enlightenment generation, this post-Newtonian generation, regarded everything that was observable, that could be written about and argued about 
as an essential element of what it was to become, to follow the pursuit of the happiness, the flourishing of the human person. The primary value of freedom of speech and press that underlay the First Amendment was not criticism of government. That was a subset of it. The primary value was that it was a fundamental human good. And that the application of it to governmental affairs in an Aristotelian sense was part of this search for truth, a societal truth, not Holmes's marketplace of ideas, which is not the test of truth. None of them would have thought that conventional voting was the way to find truth. Truth was an independent uh, quest for every person. So when did the Supreme Court finally make that turn? When did it turn to see even though it never may have quoted, and I did the research, the, uh, the uh, letter to inhabitants of Quebec, when did it make that normative turn to see that all speech has to be presumed to be a good of the human person? It wasn't with Holmes. Holmes's first foray in Shank was an application of the common law of attempts. This has been written about. That's what his clear and present danger was. You look at the common law of attempts. Impossibility is a defense, so there has to be a clear chance that it will succeed, and there has to be a near chance that it might succeed. And that's what clear and present danger is. He said, this is a common law crime, he thought. Just written into a statute, I'll do it that way. And then Learned Hand, when he did his master's opinion, says, no, you got the wrong common law. He says, it's really solicitation, which is a crime complete in itself. All you need to do is incite. Impossibility is not a defense of solicitation. All you have to do is look at the words. Both of them, and there's Zachariah Chafee nagging the heck out of them, saying, no, no, it's seditious libel, it's Blackstone, it's seditious libel. So, and finally, in Abrams, Holmes gets nagged by Chafee into mentioning the magic word, seditious libel, no. It was Brandeis. Brandeis, in his concurrence, actual dissent, but technical concurrence in Whitney, who said, in effect, that, he said it in a negative way, only in extreme situations may the government be justified in limiting speech. In other words, the default position is speech. That is why we would send our, our sons and daughters off, he would say, to defend speech, content. Now, by the time you get to 1940, that notion had filtered through to the culture of the court generally. True, it would, take, it would take a number of permutations before clear and present danger gets solidified in Brandenburg. But by 1942, you have the case of Chaplinsky. And in Chaplinsky, Justice uh, Murphy attempts to draw the line between, and I'm looking for Chaplinsky here, attempts to draw the line between what is uh, presumably guaranteed speech and what are exceptions. Now notice the change, the entire paradigmatic change that occurred because of Brandeis. There are certain well-defined and narrowly limited classes of speech, the prevention and punishment, which have never been thought to raise any constitutional problems. Look at that sentence. There are certain well-defined and narrowly limited classes of speech of the exceptions. And he tries to list them. Well, Chaplinsky had a remarkably short shelf life because uh, most of those lists fell by the way. And they fell by the way, maybe rightly or wrongly, as the court began defining its lines, but the court was on solid originalist grounds from then on. From then on, if you look at all the ancillary tests that the court devises in free speech case, such as time, place, and manner, you can have time, place, and manner. What's one of the essential parts of the test? So long as it has the regulation has nothing to do with the content of the speech. The O'Brien test. So long as the regulation has nothing to do with the content of the speech. It's content. That is what is to be protected. Ancillary harms, perhaps we can limit speech. Time, place, and manner. Uh, a harm that is in, in, uh, intimately tied to the expression, such as child pornography, 
the collection of child. It's so intimately connected that you cannot prevent the harm without also preventing the commercialization and the expression of the harm as well, the this, this, this spreading of the harm. So we have these kinds of expressions. Now we get to the modern cases, and with these I will conclude. You have some pretty terrible fact cases. You've got Stevens, you've got um, the uh, um, uh, Alvarez, um, cases in which Justice Alito in his dissent is saying, you know, wait a minute. These, these violent video games may be more of an experience than an expression, right? So he's trying to find a category, but he's still operating on the same premise, that there may be an exception to the content. More extremely, what Justice Roberts did in Stevens is he rejected the Chaplinsky formula. He said, we are not going to balance the limited use of speech uh, when it isn't really helping to get to the truth against social harms. He explicitly rejects that balancing test. He goes for really a quite uh, uh, rigid content protection test. Now why would he do that against some reasonable questions by Justice Alito? And here I'm speculating. I'm speculating that Justice Roberts sees two things happening in the world that he wants to raise a wall against here. Excuse the uh, <laughs> word. Uh, <laughs> he wants to, I'm in, I'm in, okay. Uh, um, he, wants to, he wants to raise a barrier against. First is university speech. I mean, if, when the universities get into a snit over Halloween costumes, you got a problem here. Yeah, well, I mentioned Washington, whose love of the theater fit in with the, with the declaration of speech as a fundamental good of, good of humanity. Washington wanted a national university so badly because universities from the time they were established at, at Bologna until the, the colonial, uh, the uh, independence time were places of learning and inquiry and truth seeking. Not now. Not now. The other thing Justice Roberts sees is what's happening in Canada and Europe. And he sees where hate speech and insults are taken to be criminal offenses. Uh, and I mean, what are you going to do if somebody calls one leader of a religion a bastard and another leader of a religion a pedophile, right? Horrible things to say. Are you going to throw those people in jail? Are you going to throw, are you going to put Holocaust deniers in jail? Are you going to put climate change deniers in jail, as some people are now threatening? My guess is that's what he sees, and how can he not see that sort of thing? And that's why his protection of content, even highly objectionable, offensive content, is the line he wants to draw. And I'll conclude by, with one last thing, if my second conclusion, and that is that uh, Dickinson, according to Mel Bradford, got much of what he said from John Milton. And let me quote from John Milton's Aeropagetica. I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race, where that immortal garland is to be run for, not without dust or heat. That which purifies us is trial, Milton wrote, and trial is by what is contrary. So the current Supreme Court finally got religion. It got back to its original roots. Thank you. Uh, uh, so to begin with just a little story about Nino Scalia, I, I was a student of his at University of Chicago Law School, actually in the first class that he taught upon his return to uh, teaching after his stint in the Ford uh, administration. And 
<coughs> and he became a mentor to me when I finished my, uh, my clerkships. It was he that I went to for advice about what to do in the exciting uh, days, first days of the uh, Reagan administration in, uh, in 1981. And I took his advice, went to uh, the Office of Management and Budget, which I'm not sure I'd ever even heard of uh, before, rather than somewhat more glittery and uh, prestigious positions that might have been uh, open. And uh, my, that was excellent advice. Uh, but that isn't my story. Uh, um, uh, when, uh, when Professor Scalia was named to the uh, uh, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, he was a still a professor in Chicago. And, uh, and in Hyde Park in Chicago, uh, the parish uh, Catholic church, uh, which I think is called St. Thomas, was, uh, uh, was not acceptable to, to Nino. Uh, it was a little, you know, I think they may have played guitars. It was a little loosey-goosey in, the, uh, in the theology department. And so uh, he and his family would trundle a considerable distance to the west to an, an, an a largely Italian uh, neighborhood and attended the Catholic church there. And when, uh, when he was named to the DC circuit, he underwent something which which all nominees do, which is the FBI check. And uh, this is a story from him, so, uh, the, the, uh, so w w as he recounts it, uh, he gets this rather frantic phone call from the priest uh, at his uh, parish saying, Nino, the FBI was here asking questions about you, but I assure you I didn't tell them a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if that really happened, but he, but, but he sure did get a laugh out of it. Um, so today we're talking about originalism and free speech, and I think he would have liked this, be, uh, in spite of the fact that, as Nadine said, and I didn't know those numbers, it's really 17% is a pretty low number of cases for him to uh, uh, invoke originalist reasoning in free speech cases. Um, uh, so I believe he would have liked for us to begin exploring uh, how to apply this method that he was so, he so championed and um, uh, to uh, yet another area of law where maybe, you know, he was not uh, uh, the pioneer. Uh, and. Uh, and, and I've loved hearing my fellow panelists from whom I've learned a great deal uh, here today. This is really an erudite uh, group that you uh, put me with, uh, Carlos, so thank you. Uh, the, it, it is, I think, true that free speech law has been kind of a desert when it comes to originalism. Uh, there is one very prominent and in many ways excellent uh, First Amendment case book that I almost taught from when first time I taught First Amendment law, except that I opened it up and the first sentence of this case book is, and I quote, on April 6, 1917, the United States entered World War I. Hmm, as if Blackstone didn't exist as if there had been no framers, as if Madison did not have anything to say. I mean, let alone the lost period between 1870 and, and 1920 uh, uh, that uh, uh, David has been uh, writing about. Everything begins in that. So what this means is uh, the free speech clause begins with the first Supreme Court cases about the free speech clause, because this is now we're talking about Schenck and Abrams, and and we're off to the races. Um, it's no wonder that generations of law students are under the impression uh, that free speech doctrine has just been made up by the Supreme Court. It's a complete and a, 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 a completely a, a product of that. Now I've been in many uh, uh, environs in which I talk about originalism. Uh, frequently with my uh, uh, non-originalist uh, uh, academic uh, compadres from around the country. And, you know, originalism has, a, I think, a quite compelling logic to it. 
but one of the leading comebacks is, oh, we couldn't possibly be serious about originalism as a mode of interpreting the Constitution because, oh, uh, uh, you know, we'd have so many areas of our law would have to be completely changed. There's segregation. Well, you know, I've written about uh, Brown versus Board of Education and segregation. I think we can check that one uh, off. Uh, there is uh, one person, one vote. Well, I've looked into this a little bit too, and uh, at least if you take uh, the Republican form of government clause uh, seriously, I think we can uh, check that off as something that is uh, that originalism has something to say about, if only we would let it speak. And then freedom of speech is almost always on this list of, uh, of areas of the law which would have to be radically revised if we uh, uh, took originalism uh, uh, seriously. So, uh, so let's take it seriously uh, uh, for uh, a moment. And, and here, when I say taking it seriously, I do not mean something that is somewhat common in the cases, which is rhetorical flourishes with references and quotes from the founding about how great free speech is. That is not, I mean, that may be inspirational, uh, but it doesn't really help as I, I love David's explanation of uh, New York Times against Sullivan, which is filled with quotations from especially Madison's uh, majority report uh, uh, for the Virginia uh, uh, House of Delegates and the uh, Alien and Sedition Act uh, matters, filled with quotes, but as he says, the court does not use that history in order to resolve the question that was before it. It is all uh, table setting, right? And then actual malice come, becomes the standard and uh, it, it's plucked out of, abs certainly not out of the founding. Uh, the only thing cited for the actual malice standard was a several decades then old case from the Kansas Supreme Court. So. Uh, uh, so I'm not referring to rhetorical flourishes. Um, so how might uh, Justice Scalia have gone about thinking through free speech law from if we take originalism uh, seriously? Well, of course we begin with the text because originalism is not a theory of free-floating history that happens to govern us, it's a, it's a theory about what words mean and how we understand words that are being used intentionally uh, by people in a document like the Constitution. And so, you know, the words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Um, so the key verb here is abridging. Uh, what does that mean? and also its speech and of the press, and most of the important history here is actually about press rather than speech. Uh, uh, you see overwhelmingly more references to the importance of the press, and the reason for that is, the, is that by press, what they understood was the dissemination of your ideas to large audiences, and it happened to be that that was by use of the Gutenberg's invention on paper, but the conception here is wide dis to a dissemination. If Nadine and I are having a conversation, that might be speech, but uh, if, if I'm publishing, uh, 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 if I'm Tom Paine and I'm publishing Common Sense by going to the printer and buying, paying for pamphlets that get, it's the most widely disseminated pamphlet of the revolutionary period, that's freedom of the press. So uh, that's mostly what we're going to be talking about. But abridging is the key question. Well, what does abridging mean? Uh, it, it, it's not a word we use all that commonly, but it means to reduce or shorten. I think the, uh, you think of reading an abridged version of a novel, it's a novel that's been shortened. And so abridging means uh, make, giving it less protection or a narrower scope of protection than it had before. So I think we can see from the very text of the First Amendment uh, that we already are engaging in a historical enterprise. The text of the First Amendment tells us 
uh, that we should be engaging in this historical enterprise. That is, whatever level of protection for freedom of speech and of the press there was at the time of its adoption, we're not going to get any less than that. We may expand that over time, and there may even be a kind of one-way ratchet going on, I'm not quite sure about that, uh, but in any event, we are not going to go back, we're not going to reduce the level of protection from what there was uh, before. Um, and, you know, am I just making this up? I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with purely textual uh, 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 interpretations uh, for fear that maybe we're projecting or I'm projecting a meaning that would not have occurred to them. It may seem really clear to me what abridging means, but is that really what they uh, uh, meant? And so I find uh, when the evidence is available, I find that the earliest debates over the meaning of various constitutional uh, uh, matters are extremely revealing. So that's why, for example, in the area of segregation, uh, the, my work is based upon the importance of the enforcement acts of the 14th Amendment that tell us, when they actually debated school segregation, and that tells us about uh, the meaning. Uh, it's not quite pre-enactment history, but it, but it gives us a sense of the range of argument that was actually present at the time. Uh, and uh, David referred to the uh, first of our uh, First Amendment controversies, which was over the Democratic-Republican clubs. L love that, we could talk about that, but I'm gonna move to number two, which he also referred to, which is the debate over the Sedition Act. And in particular, we are blessed to have two, I'm going to call them legal briefs, from the finest minds on both sides of that controversy. Now these aren't briefs filed in court, these were the minority and majority reports from uh, the committee in the, in the Virginia House of, of, of Delegates. One of them, the majority report written by James Madison, uh, the principal author, I think it's fair to say, of the First Amendment. The other used to be thought to be written by John Marshall, um, I think we know, I think the consensus among historians, maybe David can correct me here, I think the consensus is we're just not quite sure, uh, but it might have been Marshall. It certainly has a kind of Marshallian stamp on it as you, uh, a, as you read it. And so these are the legal arguments about what does the f free speech and press clause mean as applied to the Sedition Act. And uh, the, these reports have something in common, and they also disagree about some things. So what's in common, I think we can fairly assume, is consensus, something like consensus. And then what they have in, the, what they disagree about, I think we can fairly assume was within a, a reasonable range of interpretation at the beginning, but not definitive one way uh, or the other. This idea, by the way, that originalism is committed to one singular view of, quote, the framers, I think is quite naive. Uh, originalism is an enterprise of intellectual history, and very frequently what we find out is people disagreed. But, they, but those disagreements are revealing. They, you don't throw your hands up and say, well, they disagreed. What you ask yourself as a serious originalist is what were the grounds and range of their disagreements, and that tells us something about the range of plausible interpretation of the document that we are uh, looking at. So the common ground between the majority and the minority reports uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Virginia was that they agreed about what the word abridging means. That is to say that they both asked whether uh, the Sedition Act uh, is something that would have been blessed by the pre-existing law or whether it was a retrogression, whether it was an abridgment of the freedom of the press compared to uh, a prior law. Uh, and so uh, I think we're on fairly safe ground and, uh, and assuming that that's what the word abridging, which is the key word of the amendment, uh, uh, means. Now, here's where they disagree. Uh, the minority report takes Blackstone as being authoritative, so it's much like Leonard Levy's 
uh, legacy of suppression view that David uh, uh, referred to. Uh, Madison does not. Madison knows what Blackstone said, and he refers to Blackstone, but he gives us at least three reasons why we should not treat Blackstone as the benchmark for abridgment of freedom of speech. Uh, David dwelt particularly on one of Madison's uh, points, which has to do with popular sovereignty. So Madison argues that the idea of freedom of speech, the same idea, by the way, of freedom of speech in a regime of popular sovereignty takes on a different uh, meaning than it has in a monarchical regime. The second argument uh, that Madison makes is that even within the British system, uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the role of seditious libel was different for criticism of the crown versus criticism of what he calls responsible officials, that is to say, elected officials who are responsible to the people, and the people have a broader right to criticize those whom they choose, who are supposed to be their agents, than they do the, the crown. And so um, that's the second, and we don't have the crown. All of our officials are responsible, right? And so uh, that's his, and then his third argument is that we need to look to American practice and not just to, uh, to, to British formal law. And what does American practice look like? Again, David uh, anticipated this by, by pointing out just how much illegal speech went on. Madison essentially says we wouldn't have had an American Revolution if uh, people were obeying uh, the law with respect to these. But also, um, you, you, the, the uh, seditious libel laws had, were not enforceable in, in front of American juries uh, in late 18th century America. After the John Peter Zenger case in which he was, uh, the printer was acquitted, uh, there was not a single successful prosecution for seditious libel of a, of a colonial executive authority not even one, and they get basically the colonial governors who were being seditiously libeled every day of the week, uh, they gave up even bringing the prosecutions. And so the Madisonian argument here is we, what we're interested in is abridgment against the backdrop of American practice, and that is considerably different from, uh, uh, from Blackstone. And I think in all of this, I'm in accord with uh, uh, with uh, uh, David's uh, uh, account of the history. Why does this matter? Let me, uh, so uh, the, the, this, I think the first, the Supreme Court's first sort of doctrinally interesting attempt to give us a theory of the First Amendment was Chaplinsky versus uh, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, David Forte uh, read you the key parts here in which basically you have the right to say whatever you want unless it falls within what the, co what the Chaplinsky court calls uh, a, uh, well, these well-defined and narrowly limited categories of speech that have never been thought to be protected. Now the one key thing to notice here, and this is where I might disagree a bit with David Forte, is that these categories are all defined on the basis of content. They are all content-based categories. What are they? You know, there's an obscenity, there's incitement, there are fighting words, there are threats, there's libel. Uh, commercial speech is, a, is an interesting uh, uh, question here. Uh, fraud, uh, crime facilitating speech. There are various lists. I don't think any two Supreme Court opinions uh, have the same, exactly the same list, so much for being you know, well-defined and, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, r r rather uh, at sea exactly what the categories are going to be. But that is what uh, the, that's, and that sticks with us uh, until the early 1970s when I think for the first time, and I'm not sure that I'm agreeing with David Forte here, I think the first time that the, that, uh, that is re uh, superseded by the prohibition on content-based regulation is in a police department of Chicago against Mosley in the early 1970s. And, and then for a period of time, 
we have this very uneasy, I would just say completely incoherent and internally inconsistent uh, set of cases in which the court tells us uh, all content-based categories are subject to strict scrutiny or, or, or largely unconstitutional, except of course the ones we've already blessed, uh, the, these, con these categorical uh, exceptions, from, and we don't overrule we, uh, they narrow some of them, they overrule a few of them, but basically the, these categorical exceptions, which are all content-based, survive. Every one of them is unconstitutional under Mosley, under the content standard, and so we have this weird uh, free speech doctrine in which you have two competing principles that are actually at war with each other. They say opposite things. Content-based is, is the key to one's way of thinking it, and content-based is, is, uh, is fatal uh, to the other. And then in, in the Stevens case that uh, uh, Nadine uh, uh, told us about, the animal cruelty case, and then again in the entertainment uh, merchants case, the court in a sense closes the door on the old categories and says we're not going to create any more of those, we're not going to overrule the ones we've got, but we're going to, uh, moving forward, we're, all of our eggs are going to be in the content-based basket. Um, trouble is that the, the rule against content-based regulation is not a very good rule. Um, it is both highly underprotective in some respects, and it is highly overprotective uh, in other respects. Uh, when I, I'm, and I'm, my time is running out, so I can't go into this in the detail I would like to, uh, but if we, if we say that the key principle, the fundamental principle of free speech law is the prohibition on content-based uh, discrimination, that leaves time, place, time, place, manner, and speaker-based uh, uh, restrictions. Um, just to give, and, and, and each one of those is highly problematic and can be used by uh, uh, a, a sensorial government to suppress ideas. Uh, McCullen against Coakley uh, and Justice Scalia's dissent is a beautiful example of this. This is where you have a Massachusetts law that prohibits I'm not, I won't give you the details, but essentially has high restrictions about, uh, about uh, demonstrations in front of abortion clinics and nowhere else, and with exceptions for the employees of the abortion clinic. So, um, uh, my, if you can do this, I can prohibit uh, demonstrations outside military bases or outside police departments or at the Republican National uh, uh, Convention. Uh, Place-based uh, uh, discrimination is, of, is very easy to use for sensorial uh, purposes and yet when we focus on content rather than place, uh, uh, we necessarily shove place-based uh, regulation into an underprotected category. And how about allowing the abortion clinic employees to speak as much as they want to, uh, but not other people? Obviously, that means in these confrontations, and you should read Justice Scalia's opinion in, uh, in this case as he describes the way in which both sides are jostling, both sides are being equally loud and talking through mic uh, megaphones and so forth, but only one side is violating the law, right? So speaker-based, uh, Restrictions are also a very serious problem. So this idea of content-based uh, uh, restrictions as being central, being the organizing principle is underprotective, but it's also overprotective because there are any number of uh, content-based uh, regulations of speech that are that are everywhere and completely innocuous. Here I would recommend that you read the concurring opinions of Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan uh, in Reed versus Town of Gilbert. It's a sign case. I mean, they have great examples of things that are uh, perfectly, no one could possibly object uh, to them, but they are content, uh, they're content based. So. Uh, it seems to me that this new category, this new way of looking at it, 
uh, that came about in Mosley in the 1970s actually is turning out to be a dead end. It's turning out to be a, a, a problem rather than a solution uh, to the fr free speech problem. I suggest that we look back at Cheplinsky, uh, but try to make it more doctrinally serious. And but what we do is by we what we do is we look at abridgment as being a very convenient, judicially manageable, not based upon the judge's own intuitions or loyalties, but an objective way of seeing what kinds of speech restrictions our society has been able to tolerate without uh, uh, injury to free speech values, right? And it seems to me at least that a more intelligent, a more rigorous version of Chaplinsky, which I think goes back to the very text of the First Amendment as understood by both the majority and the minority report may be a better solution to our doctrinal uh, difficulties uh, than what we now have. Thank you. I'd like to open up uh, a question period among the panelists. If you have any questions of each other, why don't we start off with Nadine? Michael, uh, well, first of all, I thought all of the presentations were absolutely fascinating. I, I really thank you. I'm happy to be on the panel for that reason alone. I have a question for you, Michael, because I've also uh, always been fascinated by the, the verb abridge in the free speech clause as opposed to prohibit in the free exercise clause. And I've never researched it. I assume you have. I mean, common sense would suggest that um, there was, in that sense, more protection. I'm mean, just taking the words from a contemporary understanding that you may, therefore, abridge free exercise of religion. You simply may not prohibit it. Um, so there's a very um, commonsensical reason why they had to use different verbs for those two things. Namely, there was no right of free exercise of religion in the British common law before. So if you said a bridge, you would get nowhere. Uh, there was a limited right of toleration under the Toleration Act of, 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 uh, uh, of uh, 1869 for uh, Trinitarian Protestants, uh, but uh, no right of free exercise for anyone, so they couldn't use the word a bridge. Now, exactly what prohibit means and how it fits with uh, something like a compelling governmental interest test, which is all modern vocabulary, I'd love to get into, yeah. but uh, we have free speech to deal with uh, today. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I see there are lots of people oh. here. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm wondering whether yeah. we should start with the questions from the audience. Please state your name and your affiliation, and remember, it's a question. Right? <laughs> And could we let our founder uh, have uh, a privilege here? Yes. Oh, yeah. Pardon me, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is for Michael. And, then you and those who don't know our speaker, this is Steve Calabresi. 
So this is, a, this is a very difficult and extremely important question, which is when, uh, 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 put a, let's assume that there is some form of incorporation of the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment, Justice Thomas questions that, and, but put aside that, so some form of incorporation, which form is it? Um, is it that the 14th Amendment uh, is sort of a, ref is a reference to the rights of the Bill of Rights and therefore the same, and so what they intended to do was <coughs> whatever protections there had been against the federal government now exist against the states, or did they mean uh, each of these Bill of Rights is in effect reenacted in 1868 1866 to 68, uh, and thus what we mean by freedom of speech today, as in 1866 to 16, uh, 1868, is enacted. Uh, I, am, I, am of not, I am not entirely sure what I think, but at least I tend to lean toward the um, incorporation by reference view based upon a, a few snippets of evidence there's not a lot more than that, but just to, uh, when some of these questions come up, like due process, which is in the Fifth Amendment, uh, Jonathan Bingham is asked on the floor of the Congress, what does that mean? And his answer is, uh, the gentleman may go and read the cases. In other words, uh, the cases, the interpretation of the First Amendment, or I mean, the Due Process Clause, whatever it was for the federal government is going to be for, uh, for the states. That may not be right. Uh, there may be some contrary evidence too, but I, I also think it, it is sure to simplify our job if, we all, if freedom of speech <laughs> is across the board rather than, you know. I, I have a response to the <coughs> premise of your question and then a comment about the history. Is this on? Okay, you said 14th Amendment cases, not First Amendment cases. I would say there were both 14th Amendment cases and First Amendment cases, the recent ones. Well, I think and there are both 14th and First Amendment cases, but they technically arise under the 14th Amendment. Yes. And then one quick historical response. Uh, I've not looked at the debates over the ratification of the 14th Amendment in connection with free speech, but I've looked a lot at late 19th century cases dealing with free speech. And a lot of them were for subsequently forgotten because they weren't raised as free speech issues, they were raised as substantive due process issues. And there are lots of cases of that sort. There were also major debates about whether incorporation should work through the Liberty Clause or the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And I know Justice Brandeis would have preferred the Privileges and Immunities Clause. So. All right, let's take the first question. Would you please state your name? My name is Devin Watkins from the Cato Institute. And um, when I think of the speech by the founders that was most important to me in the development of our country, I would think of the, uh, the Federalist Papers, the letter from a Pennsylvania farmer that had been mentioned earlier, many of the others, but none of these actually said the name of the author of that piece. And the idea that that kind of speech could be banned by government just seems really strange to me uh, to think from originalist perspective. And yet today, we have the former CEO of Mozilla fired because he was forced by government to disclose his, uh, what he was supporting. And I'm uh, dealing with a case right now out of Illinois where the Illinois government uh, has required this individual to inform the government of everything they write online. With things like this going on today, it just seems completely inconsistent to me with the original understanding of that clause for anonymous speech. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Is that McIntyre? That's so interesting because McIntyre is an example where Scalia and Thomas both using originalist um, arguments. I'm not sure if they were your depth of originalist <laughs> arguments, Michael, as opposed to rhetorical flourishes. I haven't reread them recently enough, but uh, they arrive at polar opposite conclusions. <laughs> 
Um, I think this is another great question. Um, I believe that the right to publish your sentiments anonymously was part of the understanding of freedom of the press. Uh, when, uh, when John Wilkes was, uh, was prosecuted uh, for, uh, what was it, Britain number 45? I forget the number. Uh, uh, and he was 44. 40, 44, okay. Uh, uh, he was, uh, and he was lionized on this side of the Atlantic. The litigation took the following form. He committed seditious libel in this essay that he published anonymously. Everybody knew that he had written it, right? But uh, you could not prosecute him because you need evidence that he had written it. And there's nothing, and he, and, and you put him on the stand, but he has a right to, uh, uh, not to, to incriminate himself. So you have to have some other evidence and so who knows who wrote it? Everybody knows, but nobody actually knows except the printer. <coughs> and so they, they, hold the, they bring on the printer and demand that he fess up to the author of this essay, and he refused on the ground that people have a right to print anonymously. And he was held in contempt of court but I think on this side of the Atlantic, this was viewed as a complete outrage because indeed people do have a right to publish anonymously. Federalist papers were published anonymously. Uh, I would guess the vast majority of the essays for and against the Constitution were anonymous. And they had a reason for this, by the way. It was not, as our modern court seems to think, just to protect people against retaliation. They had a theory of speech in which ideas should be taken seriously on the basis of the idea themselves rather than being, some, just because somebody important like Hamilton wrote it, that shouldn't matter, or because some you know, schlump wrote it, that doesn't matter. The idea should be considered on its own merits. And so they actually viewed the idea of anonymous speech as being a particularly important sort of feature of dispassionate democratic uh, speech. And so I'm with the questioner uh, on the general proposition, at least, that anonymous speech is protected. Now, whether that extends to anonymous contributions uh, to other people's speech, I think is a much more complicated question. And whether that extends, and whether someone who is undergoing, who has a criminal, uh, pro has been, has been found li uh, uh, guilty of a crime uh, related to abusing speech can be limited as part of the sentence is a more complicated question. So I don't know, you know where I would come out necessarily on the two specific cases that the questioner put, but I think the general proposition is, uh, uh, is right. Just to add, the schlumps in the Democratic Republican societies often refer to themselves as Cincinnatus, things like that, classical. Well, and, and to add to this, uh, the, Demo the Democratic Republican clubs were criticized on several grounds by George Washington, by the way, among other people. One of the grounds was that they, that was that they met in secret, uh, and I and it was I and that's like that's a kind. It's not anonymous publishing. It's anonymous meeting, right? And Madison defended their right to meet in secret. Uh, which I think contributes to this, to the same conclusion. And, and I guess I have to say, in light of some of the distinctions that you drew, Michael, um, in Doe v. Reed, Scalia was drawing a distinction between anonymous speech versus anonymous action that constitutes um, the function of governing, right? Signing a petition and um, I just want to say the reason I know it's number 44 in that book that I, I mentioned, there was somebody in the United States who had, um, was in prison, I'm sorry I can't remember who it was, uh, one of the great seditious libelers during the time of the revolution and um, the number 44 became so important symbolically because of its association with pain and everybody was using it for everything and this guy was visited in jail by 44 virgins, I remember that. Uh, and uh, Akhil Amar and I were doing a talk about this at Yale Law School recently, and somebody in the audience uh, wrote, slipped me a note and said, the First Amendment has 44 words in it. <laughs>
All right, next question. Who knew? Uh, Stephen Bogakis, <laughs> a recent grad from Notre Dame. So if there's one thing that's uh, encouraging about the current level of protection of speech, it's had some bulwark against hate speech laws. Uh, but if there's one thing that's really disturbing potentially about current law is the solicitude that it gives to pornographic speech short of obscenity and the corrosive uh, effect that that has on our civil society. Maybe the First Amendment was enacted to protect that kind of speech, but I'm not sure I'm convinced of that. So how, would an, how should an originalist jurist think about pornographic speech short of obscenity? I don't think originalism helps one way or the other. It's an area where Scalia certainly had strong views, but another one where he didn't advert to originalism to the best of my recollection. Um, interestingly enough, one thing he and I agreed on, which is that the current obscenity exception uh, doesn't make any sense. As you may know, he was advocating a different concept where you would get beyond the content uh, to look at the context, and he was advocating uh, the government power to suppress what he called pandering. So you would be um, promoting sexually explicit speech uh, in a way that he thought could be regulated. To the best of my knowledge, uh, no other justice, maybe Thomas supported that, but it didn't get much traction. See, uh, I think this may be an example of where the originalist uh, line ends up with less protection in the, if, if, we, if we're talking about abridging, I don't think there's much doubt that there were pros, uh, pornography prosecutions to which no one objected, uh, certainly at the time of the framing and I think well into, uh, 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 up into the 20th century. Uh, so I, I think this was a, uh, that this is an area where there's probably more latitude for government regulation uh, than the modern court has said. Although don't forget, the modern court has not, it does, it has never said that obscenity is protected. It's just defined obscenity in a very uh, uh, narrow way. Um, I, I don't know if Michael agrees with this, but I think the Miller rules were a common sense compromise um, in which the, the court said that obscenity is not protected, but it tried to uh, create prophylactic rules which would protect substantive content, artistic merit and so forth, which was a, which was a significant, um, uh, I think, protection of, co of, of valued content that the or original uh, generation would have understood. The problem with pornography now is the type of ubiquitous pornography that's available through the internet is that much of that could be prosecuted under the Miller rules. And it's just societally we've chosen not to do it. And I just, have, again, not being a historian myself, but Ed de Grazia wrote a very long study uh, many years ago uh, called the, f the main title was Girls Lean Backward Everywhere, and his contention was that um, historically there was no suppression, there was kind of a class-based suppression of sexually explicit expression. So it was deemed to be dangerous to the masses, quote unquote, but that uh, well-educated gentlemen had uh, complete access to it. So that at least complicates the the history. Okay. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is William Hahn, and my question dovetails off of <coughs> a comment from Professor Forte and also a comment from Professor McConnell. First, with respect to this near absolutist attitude the court's jurisprudence now has towards content regulation, has it not only problematic because it is both potentially under inclusive and over inclusive and having very little basis in the original meaning? but it's also failed on its own terms in the sense that we see a very uh, highly scrutinizing and a very critical attitude towards legislative attempts at regulating, say, indecency on television, uh, but on the same token when it comes to anonymous political speech like we've heard about, or even in McCullen, the chief not calling that a content-based regulation. Um, it seems as if the doctrinal manipulation is still going on even with this absolutist language, and then also sort of culturally has it created a, 
a mentality that says there is no such thing as valuable speech. That vulgarity uh, that we'll defend wrapped with the First Amendment on a college campus is no different than political speech. And maybe even we can you know, take a cue from the court's doctrinal manipulation and subject political speakers on campus to speech zones and have trigger warnings, but if you know a, a, a vulgar campus event wants to happen and anyone criticizes it, oh, it's First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment. I'm just wondering if the court's kind of perverted the dialogue on that. Well, there's a lot in your question. Let me take the last part of the question. You might be referring to um, the problematical phrase in Cohen, one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric, in which the court eschewed the idea that the, the government could um, uh, referee uh, civic discourse to make sure it was civil. Um, and, to, and to what extent that has had a significant influence on, on the court. Well, a, around that phrase, Justice Harlan uh, said that the, it, it wasn't in principle wrong for the government to attempt to maintain civility within the debates of substance, but it wasn't something that the court had the capacity to draw lines with. There were no logical, principled points that he could find. Now, I, I shepherdized that phrase, and the Supreme Court has only used it four times subsequently, I think, in, from the 1970s. Three times by Justice Stevens in dissent, who said, yeah, anything goes, right, uh, in, in dissent. And one, and one uh, by Justice Roberts in, in a recent case, that was the Holder humanitarian case, in which he said, unlike style uh, of speech in which the court has no competency to be able to draw lines as to what is an appropriate style, modality of speech, a rhetoric of speech or not, uh, the government does have principles by which it could determine whether uh, speech that assists a terrorist organization is helpful to it or not. So we used it just to distinguish who had expertise or not. Well, I was, one of my research areas is the, uh, is the late 1790s, and if you, read, if you read the descriptions of John Adams in the press, um, uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, maybe that's why they pass. I'm not sure that's why Abigail said sign the Sedition Act. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the only piece of advice that was wrong that John yeah. took from her. Um, it, it seems to me if, if that were somehow acceptable uh, rhetoric, I don't see how we can draw significant lines absent of another type of harm, uh, which you might define as noise or disruption of a of a courthouse with a properly drawn statute, absent some other kind of harm. But, but the content itself of the rhetoric, I find difficult to find lines where we could draw. Otherwise, we have the, the heckler's veto in spades happening. If that occurs. I, I'm so glad that David mentioned um, uh, Cohen versus California, uh, fuck the draft, which both, I mean, for today's audience, I just have to put in the historical context in 1971, the F word as at most it was called in polite society was as shocking as the so-called N word is today, literally. I mean, the Chief Justice um, instructed the ACLU lawyer who was arguing the case, you're not gonna use that word in the argument. Uh, the Chief Justice, uh, he called it the screw the draft case. He wouldn't even refer to it as the fuck the draft case. He begged Harlan, literally, there's a, somebody did an interview and, and there's a transcript and he said, John, you're not gonna use that word in the opinion, are you? I beg you, John, it would destroy this court if you use that word. So I think for us to understand the significance that you know the gentlemanly Republican Wall Street lawyer John Marshall Harlan writing that opinion, 
uh, to understand the impact of it, we have to look at today's analogy, which I really do think is what would be considered to be the most shocking, the most distressing word, that even in the context of defending the right to say it, we avoid using it. That's how that word was seen then. And, and then you add to that the overall context, the message of criticizing the draft at a time when that was equally incendiary. Uh, that really underscores the, the, the very powerful endorsement of even speech that was seen as, you know, as crude and vulgar and shocking as you could be in that social and historical context. Okay, next question. Hi, Zach Smith. Looking at the original meaning for the First Amendment, I'm a little concerned that in some of the um, comments, and we're only looking at a few key documents, which I understand are important, um, but if we're truly looking to un understand what the public understood at that time, shouldn't we be looking at a larger database of all documents, um, diaries, records, pamphlets, instead of just the few key documents? I totally agree with that, and I did. You know. There are, <laughs> wow. I'm a historian, you know, there are collections of resolutions of these democratic Republican societies, clubs, uh, that reflect popular views. Yes. You can look at what people wrote in newspapers. I mean, yes. the best way to see the connection between free speech and popular sovereignty is to look much more broadly than at Madison. So I take your point, but I think when one looks beyond official statements, uh, this notion that we need free, to protect free speech in order to preserve popular sovereignty was, that was to be widely shared uh, among American citizens. And, and the book that I mentioned um, that came out this year, let me just, I, I was self-censoring because of time constraints, uh, but he talked about, he surveyed everything and he said that that generation was using every means of dissent available for, to them, from newspapers and pamphlets to songs, sermons, speeches, poems, plays, letters, petitions, liberty trees, and much more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, maybe this will be the last question and we will adjourn. Um, well, my name is Suranjan Sen. I'm a hello. Oh. Yeah. I'm a I'm a JD student, and uh, my my question. I was wondering, uh, uh, perhaps you're pointing out, Judge McConnell, the word a bridge may uh, may ha address this in somewhat, perhaps not. But in any case, I'm interested in what any of you may have to say about this. Um, so there have been some highly um, highly publicized banning on on. Uh, Twitter and perhaps other social media sites and uh, I was wondering if uh, in according to, to any, any of you if there could possibly be an originalist uh, argument in favor of some sort of either depending how you want to look at it restrictions of such uh, social media sites of on banning or rather protections constitutionally mandated protections of people's uh, rights uh, to have access to such platforms in light of their increasing uh, ubiquity in, in modern society, if, if not necessity in engaging in modern society. So I in your opinion, would there be an originalist argument to be made in that kind of uh, First Amendment interpretation? I say no again. This is a good example of new issues that have arisen in a much later society that the original meaning just doesn't answer, in my view. Well, um, wait, it, the, I, I, maybe I misconstrued the question. I don't know the answer, but I thought that the question was, is there any originalist argument with respect to either the First or the Fourteenth Amendment um, that, there, that we should be pre protected against private restrictions on speech. I mean, like against the state action doctrine. I, I didn't understand. Yeah, oh, but is, 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 is there? I, I assume not, but I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if this is gonna be helpful, yeah. but um, it, 
really the question is, do we understand Twitter and these other things as being equivalent to printers uh, at the time of the revolution? And, uh, and this issue did, did come up with, consider with a great deal of frequency. Uh, some newspapers, so, so newspapers were really printers. There weren't journalists, right? Uh, uh, and printers would print, they would print things from the London newspapers or, or people would send in letters or reports. That, uh, or it was actually a little bit like Twitter in that ordinary citizens would report on what they see and then they would send it in to the printer and the printer would put it in these things that we call newspapers that are really don't have a lot to do with modern newspapers. Some newspapers were partisan and would only publish things of their, oh, and there were part, newspapers on both sides that were partisan. And then there were other newspapers, which I think interestingly, and I don't, I'm not quite sure what I make of this, but they called themselves free press. So when you say freedom of the press, free press were newspapers that would publish things from both sides without censorship. Um, but uh, everyone seemed to agree that part of the freedom of the press was that the printer got to decide. So you could be Federalist, you could be Republican, you could be free press, it's up to you. Part of the freedom of the press was you get to decide editorial judgment. Now, if we were to try to construct an argument for regulating Twitter, I think we have to look to, we have to say that that analogy to early newspapers is false and that what Twitter, Twitter more resembles a, a, a public accommodation. Uh, and here I, I think we almost, there's not much public accommodation law. I'm not sure that there's any, there might be some ends, I guess, where public accommodation, a little bit of public accommodation law at the time of the founding. But you'd have to say that this would be one of those businesses like inns, railways, uh, mills that have to extend their facilities on a non-discriminatory basis to everyone who is able to pay. And uh, uh, none of those facilities was a, what I would call a First Amendment facility. But that's, I think, if you wanted to construct an argument for preventing Twitter from being a censor, uh, I think you'd have to move in that direction, and I don't know if it would work. Maybe taverns would be a, a, a potential analogy, because those were great venues for debate and discussion yes. and circulation. But they also did, even though they were, I think, sometimes called places of public accommodation, yeah. taverns and coffee houses yeah, right, were right. often partisan so that mm. you actually had signs in front of the tavern that would give you a clue as to whether this is a Tory or a Whig establishment. And my goodness, if you went in the wrong place, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, we, we have not originated political violence, right? <laughs> With thank, that, thank you uh, very much. We've come to the end of our time, and would you join me in giving this superb panel a hand?